your patience in staying with us. Um, we, we have an entitlement crisis on our hands, and the unfunded liability, uh, as you know, Madam Secretary, uh, for Medicare alone is $35 trillion by the year 2075. $35 trillion. And if left unaddressed, this obligation alone could ruin our future economy. Yet in the President's budget, this $3.8 trillion budget request, I, I don't see any concrete uh, proposals to improve the Medicare solvency outside of the $251 million that you mentioned uh, in your budget to increase to fight waste, fraud, and abuse. There's, surely there are more initiatives uh, available. They certainly are needed to strengthen the Medicare program for our seniors. Why are there no other initiatives included in the budget request so that we can extend the Medicare solvency? Well, Congressman, I think that, again, the budget is um, put together um, as a companion piece to a uh, number of the features in health reform, and we hope to be able to move forward aggressively uh, in both fronts, uh, moving toward more of a coordinated care strategy on bundled payments, which is a way to actually ensure that we can do everything from reducing the uh, return of one out of every five Medicare patient to the hospital um, and keep folks not only healthier but at home working on hospital-based infections, which not only kill 100,000 Americans a year but um, actually cost hundreds of millions of dollars year in and year out. Uh, those strategies are very much a part of the, the look forward. We're um, beginning to focus uh, more of the payment on primary care and um, general practitioners recognizing that uh, keeping people well at the front end. Uh, Madam Secretary, I'm going, to, I'm going to interrupt you. I have a couple more questions I want to ask. I agree with you on that point. Certainly wellness is the way to go rather than waiting until people get sick, and yeah. I certainly don't disagree with you on that as a physician member. Uh, you know, the, the mandatory part of our budget is probably 60 percent of our spending uh, and yet in the President's budget, uh, there's some shifting of some of, our, of the discretionary spending, particularly on, on the money that was going to be given to the states to create these, help create these high-risk pools, I think something like $55 million, and in, in, in make that mandatory spending. It makes it easy, of course, to freeze discretionary uh, and, and fulfill his pledge to do that over a three-year period, but it seems to me it's pretty irresponsible to create additional mandatory spending uh, of any amount at a time when we're uh, suffering so badly uh, with these $1.6 trillion deficits as far as the eye can see. Would you agree with me that uh, creating additional mandatory spending is certainly not in our best interest? Well, I think any additional mandatory spending needs to be looked at very carefully. I would certainly agree well, with that. Well, thank you, Madam Secretary, and I, I appreciate that response. Let me ask you one quick last question. And you know uh, from previous uh, times that you've been with us, I've always had some concern over the amount of money that we spent uh, on H1N1 and where that money goes and what we do with uh, uh, the amount that's left over and, indeed, what we do with the vaccine that's not used. Uh, under the CDC portion of the budget, uh, I see there are 20, 225 million dollars listed as balances from the pandemic flu fund that was passed in June. Uh, just to be clear, how much of the original 7.7 .7 billion dollars that was given to the president in June to combat H1N1 virus remains? How much of that money has been unspent at this point? Um, Congressman, I don't want to give you an incomplete answer. What I would very much like to do is give you a, a very thorough breakdown of where exactly the money has been spent and where it is. I know that um, a portion of the supplemental funding, the 209 supplemental funding uh, that was designed to um, deal with the H1N1. Madam Secretary, Secretary fair enough. If you, if you would give me a, 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 I know you don't have time now, and I want to ask you one, one last thing, but if you'll give me a report on that, I would very much appreciate that if you would get back to me in a timely fashion. Uh, the, the last thing real quickly, in regard to the stockpile of H1N1, uh, what percentage, or how many people have we actually reached uh, that have been vaccinated? Uh, and of the remaining stockpile and what percentage actually of the stockpile remains, what happens with that next year? Can we utilize that in any way, any effective way, or do we have to just uh, discard it? 
Well, Congressman, my last numbers from CDC are, um, I think we're in the 64, 65 million range in terms of people who have been vaccinated. States are continuing to order vaccine, as you know, um, just at the first of the year, the vaccine opportunities opened up. So seniors are beginning to be vaccinated. Populations who weren't in the high-risk pool are being vaccinated. And what is happening is that um, the bulk antigen is absolutely able to be um, used for future uh, vaccinations. The fill and finish has a more limited time period, so there has been a, um, a, an attempt not to fill and finish every, uh, every amount of the bulk antigen that has been purchased, and that's being looked at as the, st but the states are continuing to order vaccine. And so we're looking at that issue very carefully. Madam Secretary, thank you. Thank you for your patience. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Uh, gentlewoman from Florida, Ms. Castor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome, Madam Secretary. The, collect the collective cheer you heard from Florida families and hospitals uh, last Friday afternoon was a result of your efforts to work with us on a um, 1115 Medicaid waiver, an amendment to that. And I want to thank you very much and Sydney Mann and Bridget Taylor and your entire team for, for helping us get that done. Um, and then you came to our aid again this week because HHS rightfully, uh, rightfully activated the National Disaster Medical System um, because after the January 12th uh, earthquake in Haiti, hundreds of evacuees have come to the state of Florida for, for medical care and treatment uh, that's not available in Haiti. In fact, the state of Florida has uh, treated 618 people from Haiti who were injured in the earthquake. Uh, many are still in our hospitals receiving treatment, and that national disaster medical system uh, will, will help. It's helping evacuated Americans and Haitians uh, and I've, we really appreciate it. Here's my question. How long will it remain activated? I think, Congresswoman, that's a, um, a question that um, we're not quite sure that we can answer right now. What was clear in the conversations with your governor and uh, other state officials like yourself is that the disproportionate um, brunt that Florida was bearing uh, did not seem appropriate when there was really a national and international response to the crisis. So um, there, the effort is to stand up medical care in Haiti as quickly as possible to a number of the people being evacuated right now are actually doing post-op care. They have surgical treatment on the USNS Comfort and then need to be brought somewhere for um, care that hopefully will be available in Haiti in the very near future. There's a 325-bed hospital um, that should be up and running uh, within days, literally, that can be expanded to 1,000 beds, doctors and medical supplies being gathered. So the government of Haiti and others would far prefer, frankly, that, that, that we help build those assets in Haiti, and that's what really the international community is responding to. So this is a stopgap. But right. we, I can't tell you exactly okay, how long. Okay, so we'll continue to, to have the dialogue on that. Yeah. And Florida's Department of Children and Families has begun repatriation efforts for more than 20,000 Haitians uh, following the earthquake. Under the current law, Haitians who are granted temporary protective status are considered Cuban Haitian entrants and are therefore eligible for medical uh, federal assistance such as Medicaid for seven years after they arrive in the United States. Consequently, Florida, and I'm sure other states, will have a sizable number of newly Medicaid-eligible residents for years to come. Uh, does, does the administration, administration's budget consider this? Uh, I know that the budget probably was mostly put together before this time, so, uh, well, does it consider this? No, the budget yeah. really was put together before the earthquake hit, and so we are having conversations not only in our agency but government-wide about um, what this assistance needs to in, include. Good. So you'll, you'll continue to work with us. Uh, and with your, your Office of Children and Families has been absolutely spectacular. Well, I appreciate that. I'll pass that on to the Secretary. 
Um, would this be handled through FMAP or some other means, or we'll have that dialogue going forward? Well, currently, um, Congresswoman, there are lots of alternatives. Uh, our Office of Ret Refugee um, Assistance is one. There are other avenues, but those, those conversations are really underway. Okay. Um, in a somewhat related vein, you know, there are many states that, that uh, are prone to natural disasters. For example, in Florida, in recent years, we've, we were hit by seven hurricanes. And this skewed our FMAP calculation because after the hurricanes, we had a huge uh, run-up of reconstruction and jobs. So that when the recession hit, uh, the formula really hurt us. We didn't have the money coming in under, under FMAP. Now, fortunately, through the Recovery Act, we've made some of that up. But I'd like to look at a permanent solution for states that run into these, these kind of problems uh, so that at the worst time we're not penalized just because of a post-disaster run-up in employment. Would you work with me on, on that type of solution, or do you have any any recommendations at this time on how? No, I think that's that. a very real issue and problem that is not unique to Florida. It's been experienced by a number of states, and I think there are also a number of members who think that the entire FMAP formula needs to be revisited, so this could be one aspect of that. Thank you very much. Gentlewoman's time has expired. Gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Sarbanes. I know you're delighted to see me because I'm the last one to ask you questions. Always uh -huh. delighted to see you, Congressman. Thank you. Um, first of all, I want to commend you on your remarkable composure, um, which I judge is remarkable because if I had to sit where you are sitting and bear some of the hectoring that you've worn today, I don't think I would have been able to exhibit the same composure, and you don't have to respond uh, to that. Um, I do want to say that um, I think you're doing a wonderful job in your position and, and um, you, you have a bearing which I think uh, will stand the agency in good stead and has been very effective in dealing with the public on all manner of issues including the H1N1 um, flu virus uh, and others and um, we're, we're really blessed to have you there. Uh, it cannot have been easy to put this budget together, given uh, what a moving target the health uh, reform bill has been. Um, and regardless of what happens with that reform effort, uh, your, your work uh, will remain really at the center of the health um, uh, system, and particularly the public health system. And um, so I thank you for the, for the work you're doing, and you've clearly put together a tremendous staff that I know is working um, around the clock on these issues. There's so many good things that are in those health reform bills, um, and many of them are ones that your budget reflects as well. Um, and I just wanted to point to a, a couple of them and ask a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, there's a discussion of you know, these Medicare demonstration projects um, and some other initiatives to determine how to better align uh, provider payments um, with the kinds of outcomes and treatments and regimens that we want to see. I'm, I'm, I've been long fascinated by the, the uh, I think, over